Hi, I'm Tico with Sprott Global Resource Investments, and I'm sitting down here today with Mr. Rick Roll, Chairman of Sprott U.S. Holdings. Rick, as always, good to see you. My pleasure. Thank you. So uh, there's a topic I'd like to speak with you about today, that uh, the analogy of which I'm still working on, uh, and that is either corporate hostage taking or a leaky ship, a corporate ship where we go out and we find there's a bunch of holes letting in water. And I want to sort of start with painting the uh, hypothetical scenario of a hardworking, young, diligent resource speculator uh, finds the right exploration company, or let's say a prospect generation company, makes a discovery. It turns out to be a good one. Uh, it looks to be a commercially economic uh, deposit of some material. And they find then that they've got a five to eight year wait before that deposit moves into production. They'll have to finance repeatedly along the way. And so what the young speculator starts to find is uh, surprises in areas that they hadn't anticipated before, uh, things that maybe they haven't recognized uh, in the uh, change of control provisions, uh, general and administrative fees, success fees, uh, private, placement that, uh, private placements that may have interesting terms on them. So I'd like to ask, uh, you've been financing resource companies for your entire adult career. Uh, for the things I mentioned and then more, which we'll get into, what are some of the more egregious examples that you've seen? <laughs> well, clearly this is autobiographical, uh, both you and I, uh, and the circumstance that you describe is accurate. The first thing is that the young speculator needs to prepare himself or herself ahead of time. Understanding that the time frames involved in both exploration and development are much longer than you think they will be. Um, so. The first thing is forewarned is forearmed. The second thing that you need to understand, and Buffett makes a good point of this, is that uh, anticipating outcomes based on the self-interest of the executives is the best way to understand the way things are going to unfold. Um, many, I won't say most, although it might be most, junior mining companies don't regard shareholders as partners. They regard them as unsecured creditors. And you need to understand the circumstance in that context. One of the ways that you can defend yourself in this circumstance is by limiting your speculations, irrespective of apparent prospectivity or promotion, to companies that are headed by people who have been serially successful in the past. <clears throat> I'm not suggesting to you, Tokoa, that my own investments with, say, Lucas Lundin or Bob Quartermain or Robert Friedland or Ross Beatty or Clive Johnson have always been successful. I am suggesting, however, that with a class one team at the helm, uh, I am more likely to be successful than not successful. With regards to uh, the other things that you've talked about, I think it's important that the speculator participate in the game. Too many times speculators have uh, set in uh, portfolios for me to review. You know that we do no obligation portfolio reviews for people where we rate the resource stocks in their portfolio. And too often speculators have sent me portfolios that were 60 or 70 companies long. The idea that that speculator, who of course probably has a life outside of speculation, has the time to devote to understanding all those issues, the probability of that is almost nil. So one of the things that speculators need to do is they need to narrow their focus to the number of companies that they're willing to spend an hour a month on each. If you're willing to spend 10 hours a month, then you can have 10 companies. 20 hours a month, 20 companies. But one of the things that you need to do is familiarize yourself with the filing statements. One uh, very scary statistic that we turned up about 10 years ago, and this wasn't a, a blanket survey, but we pulled, I think the number was 25 junior exploration companies at random from the TSXV, and we found of the 25 companies that we pulled at random, over 60% of the capital raised went to selling general and administrative expense, and less than 40% of the capital raised went into project development. Now that's a disgusting statistic. If a junior was to joint venture a company with a major, they'd be allowed a 15% expense override. But the efficiency, if you can call it that in public markets, was a 60% allocation to general administrative expense. Similarly, uh, 
there are known performers or poor performers in the industry who are pretty famous for um, doing preferential private placements to themselves r rather than admitting long-suffering, long-time shareholders on the same terms and conditions. One of the reasons that I started my private partnership, Rights and Pipes, was I've always believed that the fairest form of financing in a down market like the one we're in today is a rights offering where the management team will offer uh, shareholders the right to participate in a down round. This is good for a couple reasons because the people who've gotten the company to the point where it is today deserve the opportunity to participate in monetizing the success. It's also useful too because if a company goes out on a rights offering to raise let's say five million dollars and the management team doesn't feel compelled to write a check themselves it says something to you as a check writer about the relative valuation of the issuer in the eyes of the people who ought to know best. Mm -hmm. uh, so Rick, uh, shifting gears a little bit, I'd like to go over a couple terms uh, and ask for your definition of them uh, for hopefully our viewers' benefit. And that is uh, the first one, mission drift. I've heard you use this a couple times in relation to companies that may have received a financing. Uh, what, is, what does the term mean? Well, there were, in the last cycle, a couple, a couple of companies that set out to buy assets at distressed prices uh, in the manner that, as an example, Ross Beatty might have done in Lumina, taking advantage of the distressed nature of markets to buy rather than drill assets. And as their market capitalizations improved, those companies chose to become beneficiators of those assets rather than consolidators. That would be an example of mission drift. Too often, management teams tell the story that they need to tell at the time they're telling it to raise the money. I've heard maybe 10 times in my life managers excuse mission drift by saying money is fungible. What they seem to mean is that my money is fungible. It's important to me that somebody either does with my money what he or she says they're going to do or explain a change of course very thoroughly to me before they have the temerity to use my money for some purpose other than the purpose for which it was extracted. Mm -hmm. Change of control provisions. What does that mean and what are maybe uh, what may be a more egregious example of this oh, have you seen? This is really egregious. Um, many people raise money from private parties with the view that they're going to make a discovery and sell the discovery. And what you learn is that the management teams get paid, many of the management teams get paid twice. I have seen in a number of circumstances uh, management teams put change of control provisions in where if the company is sold, which was their stated intention, uh, they get compensation on sale equal to five years of their average salary and bonus expense and get five years of ancillary expenses, that is things like rent and health benefits, as a consequence of the sale. That's one of the reasons why some management teams are willing to entertain uh, uh, merger and acquisition where their only participation in the company is, at, in fact, as uh, option holders. Um, I I've had a lot of bad experience, uh, frankly, uh, with change of control provisions, which is one of the reasons why I study them. It doesn't mean in a circumstance where there are change of control provisions that you don't speculate. It's just that you understand the nature of the management team before you get in bed with them. Mm -hmm. What could be a layman term, Rick, for uh, general and administrative expenses? And what could be a, an egregious example of uh, such that you may have seen? Well, let's answer the question backwards. I mean, an egregious example would be the TSXV resource index. The length and breadth of the industry spends more money in general and administrative expense uh, than is rationally feasible, which is why the exploration, one of the reasons why the exploration business loses so much money on an annual basis. But I would define general and administrative expenses as all expenses that aren't project related. 
And it's important to know that many companies add project expenses back into general administrative expense. In other words, the VP exploration of a company and maybe the CEO of a company might be salaried at the company level, but they might also be consultants uh, so that their own time and expense is added in again at the exploration level. So I would regard all non-exploration development expenses as general and minimum expenses. Uh, rent, wages, salaries, listing fees, copier expense, phone expense, promotion, Travel. I'm not trying to suggest to you, Tacoa, that those aren't necessary parts of running a business. Uh, I have seen several circumstances where $10 million market cap companies with $800,000 in the treasury were paying the CEO $450,000 a year. In other words, the CEO salary alone was taking 5% of market cap on an annual basis. That means that the CEO him or herself, if you assume that they have $800,000 left in the company, will bankrupt the company in a year and three quarters. Mm -hmm. And uh, so these items, these aren't secret, right? These are published somewhere? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Uh, every quarter, a public company is required to distribute to you a balance sheet and an income statement, and you should read them. Mm -hmm. And if you have questions about them, if you're a Sprott client, you should talk to your Sprott broker or you should talk to me. Okay. Success fee. Uh, is this a term that we've uh, uh, <laughs> seen before? I once had a fellow who is a personal friend of mine, actually, who I had installed as president of his company. In other words, I put him in his position. Uh, we did a $14 million financing for his company, and he tried to extract a success fee as a consequence of introducing me to me when I introduced him to the company that he was CEO of. Uh, there are circumstances where success fees are warranted, but I would suggest to you that circumstances where success fees are warranted are where success fees are negotiated ahead of time and put in the proxy and are approved by shareholders on a forward thinking, not retroactive basis. Mm -hmm. How about uh, oddly structured private placement terms that you might see on a press release that involve the insiders or management of a company? Are, are there any examples that just looked kind of silly to you? Well, I always like oddly structured private placements when they include me. Uh, but if they don't include me, of course, uh, they're more problematic. The private placements that involve insiders that I really dislike are private placements where the company loans the executives the money to take down the private placement. In other words, where part of the private placement is just a recycle that allows the management team to sell the stock and strip the warrant, which is an artificial way of increasing their options position. And that's fairly competent. It's greedy in the extreme. And actually, I should be grateful for it, because when I see that circumstance come, come up, uh, I take that executive out of my Rolodex. Yes, I still have a Rolodex. And I throw it away. Rick, uh, at any time in your career, looking inward, do you think there may have been a time that we could have benefited a little bit too much by being on the receiving end of a deal? Oh, uh, certainly, certainly. In other words, were we ever lucky? I don't believe that a management team ever negotiated with me in a way where they were determined to do me a favor. Uh, I have had circumstances where the consequence of my actions generated a reward for me uh, that was much more than I expected, uh, and I'm hoping that that continues in the future. I will tell you, however, as a speculator, usually your gains are hard won. Uh, I'm reminded by the scientist's observation that the harder they work, the luckier they get. And a circumstance where you limit your speculations to deposits that could be very large, with management teams that are of high reputation and have been serially successful in markets that are bleak as opposed to markets that are buoyant. Uh, if you do those three things, the probability of having pleasant rather than unpleasant surprises is much higher. Mm -hmm. uh, so Rick, in this talk, we've been covering all the ways to or some of the ways to get beat up as a shareholder. Uh, but what have you found may be the best way to uh, avoid uh, that people. Uh, the business is regarded and is sold as an asset-intensive business. 
And it is to some degree, but the best people keep ending up with the best assets. Uh, I'm fond of quoting Buffett, so I'm going to do it one more time. Buffett points out that there's millions of people around the world that can play basketball, but the way to win games is to have a couple of seven-footers on your team. And there are a series of serially successful people around the world. That doesn't mean that every time they go out they're going to succeed. That isn't what it means. It means that if you associate with them, you are more likely than when you associate with less successful people of having a successful outcome. And the way that you get to associate with those people at a reasonable price, maybe not a great price, but a reasonable price, is to associate with those people at a point in time when the public perception of the outlook for the industry is lousy. In other words, buying great goods, great people on sale, is the best way to participate in any kind of speculation. Mm -hmm. Well, Mr. Rick Rule, Chairman of Sprout U.S. Holdings, thanks for sharing your comments with us. Pleasure. Thank you.